everyone, and welcome to a- another podcast episode. I am G from Simply G, joined by my always wonderful co-host, Ray from Whimsical Pictures. Hi, everyone, and happy Thanksgiving to the Americans. <laughs> Yay! Um, so this month, November, we are doing another creator mangaka spotlight we're going to be talking about the wonderful and quite prolific in English uh, mangaka Natsume Ono. You may have heard of her. She's had a couple of her titles adapted into anime, which we will be talking about. Uh, the manga more so than the anime, I think. But she has quite a bit, <laughs> quite a bit, both in English and Japanese. Some of her stuff is not available uh, for the English-speaking world, but we really have gotten a lot of her stuff, considering that... I wouldn't necessarily expect her to be the most popular creator. Who knows? Maybe I just am not aware of of these things. But um, I am... I think, G. <laughs> I think, G. she's catering to a few tastes that don't get catered to very often. Yes, this is very true. <laughs> she's found her niche, <laughs> and she's found, you know, she knows her passions, and she's going for it. And if nothing else... Hats off to her because I mean she's living her best life out here. She's just, honestly, she's yes, creating the she media she wants. Thriving. To see. <laughs> she is thriving. <laughs> so, um, if you're not necessarily familiar with this creator's name, you may recognize some of her more popular works, especially the ones that have gotten anime adaptations, namely Ristorante Paradiso, Aka Thirteen and the House of Five Leaves. But, as I mentioned, we have seen several of her other titles also available in English, as well as her vast catalogue of BL, um, which she publishes under the name Basso, and quite a few of her other longer titles. Um, she has an ongoing title in Japanese right now, which hasn't made the jump to English publishing um, as of yet, and who knows if it ever will, but it would be interesting to have another one of her titles um, available. <laughs> because I, I am a fan, I do like a lot of her works. I don't really necessarily share her her proclivities, as it were, but I do think that she has a unique style um, in manga uh, outside of what we no typically see um, being brought over. And Ray, I know you're somewhat m less familiar. You've been reading up on her this week, and it's it, it'd be nice to hearing your perspective um, as a newish newish reader. Yeah. <laughs> So I hadn't read much. I'd read a couple bits and pieces uh, back in high school uh, and, you know, have in the intermittent years forgotten, like, everything mm -hmm. that I've read. <laughs> I don't even remember <laughs> what I picked up. But um, I, I don't necessarily think that her books are that interesting to most people high school students yes <laughs> <laughs> uh she definitely caters to a bit of an older uh age demographic her works have this sort of more mature feel to them um not in terms of like you know content but <laughs> the atmosphere is very adult i guess mm -hmm. um but yeah so i really was coming in almost blind and i asked g for to rattle off a list of titles that i should check out that cover uh the length of what we have in english pretty well and so i have come to this episode having been tread um <laughs> a lot of those so <laughs> oh my goodness she she has put in such an effort this uh these last couple of days this last week and i applaud i applaud you right <laughs> you did so y'all better watch <laughs> uh i feel like it was uh -huh. Go ahead. it was very enjoyable like i i feel like her works have a very cozy atmosphere to them mm -hmm. that's very befitting of the autumn season and the beginning of winter, so I feel like I was definitely kind of in a mood for it. Mm -hmm. 
And I think that's the perfect thing to start with is that I th her a lot of her titles, um, even her longer titles, they're much more focused on, um, even though, though there is larger plots sometimes being incorporated, a lot of them are much more just a uh, situational reveling in the atmosphere, <laughs> reveling in the aesthetic of a certain moment, uh, namely, typically, uh, European setting, uh, lots of food, lots of like fine dining, and handsome older gentlemen. She's definitely into those. Um, and nothing incorporates <laughs> all of those, those factors more so than one of her earliest titles available in English, one of the earliest titles of hers to get an anime adaptation, Ristorante Paradiso, um, which you may or may not have heard of. The DVD of the anime is available in English uh, in the US, subtitled, and uh, is pretty short. I think it's 11 or 12 episodes. And that is an adaptation of both the single volume Ristorante Paradiso, which is the uh, introduction to the whole setting and to the characters, and also the subsequent three volume sequel called Gente, which kind of explores the larger cast in a bit more detail and a bit more <laughs> interest um, compared to the, the single volume. Yeah, uh, I was only going to read Ristorante Paradiso, but then I, I was feeling it, so I read the three volumes of Gente as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but this is the original first volume, Ristorante Paradiso is a single volume manga it's about this girl uh who i don't remember where she's from somewhere in europe and she moves to rome specifically to go to the restaurant of her mother's husband she's basically been abandoned more or less by her mother because her mother wanted to pursue this dude who didn't want to marry a woman with kids. So she was just like, daughter? I don't have a daughter. What are you talking about? <laughs> and dumped her daughter off with uh, her parents. <laughs> Which sure is traumatic, but we don't really go into that that much. No. <laughs> um, but the daughter shows up at... Uh, the husband's restaurant, like, where's your manager? I got something to tell him. <laughs> and instead she runs into her mom and her mom's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> Look, you can pretend to be my friend's daughter. I will get you a really nice place, mm -hmm. okay, in Rome. All expenses paid. <laughs> Pay for all your food. You're going to have a great life. Just don't <laughs> tell that man. <laughs> um, so from then on, it's just her kind of frequenting the restaurant of her mom's husband and hanging out with the wait staff there who are all uh, according to her mother's tastes because her mother's husband is a very loving man who wants to provide everything for his angel um this restaurant is entirely staffed by handsome older gentlemen who wear glasses <laughs> even if they don't need to wear glasses <laughs> they still wear glasses as part of their uniform because that's how mama likes it <laughs> um and yeah it's just a it's a very low-key sort of reverse harem manga with a gimmick more or less. Yeah. There's delicious Italian food and Italian wine and Italian views and Italian gentlemen. <laughs> That's what it is. That's what it's here for. <laughs> Doesn't overstay its welcome. No. You know? No. It's <laughs> it's pretty tightly run and once you do get into the sequel volumes and you get more into the stories of the wait staff or the staff at this restaurant and their role there and their histories, their backgrounds, their families, their situations, why they're working in this particular cafe or restaurant, 
Um, it's more it's more interesting than the original like single volume of Ristorante Parody, so I think we can yeah. agree on that. Um, unfortunately, is yeah, her name, um, what's, I don't remember the girl's name, but she's not necessarily that. What is her name? To uh, <laughs> Nicoletta. Nicoletta. Her name is Nicoletta. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I don't speak Italian, so <laughs> uh, this episode is going to have a lot of butchered names in it. Yeah, it's been many years since I've had to brush <laughs> off my my schoolgirl Italian, so apologies in advance for mispronunciations. Yeah. Incidentally, Natsume Ono was an exchange student in Italy mm-hmm. in her college days uh, uh, yeah. for like a year, and it shows. Like She <laughs> has a very exchange student way of looking at Italy. She's, Mm. like, the kind of person, like, the kind of vibe of, like, someone who's, like, gone to study abroad in some country that they're infatuated with and was there just long enough uh, to freshly polish the rose-colored glasses (laughs) and go home, like, this is the greatest country on the planet. Yeah. It's definitely, um, I think Naona has had a long-running whirlwind romance with with Italy, and <laughs> Europe in general, but especially Italy. It yes. pops up a lot, yep. um, which is, you know, <laughs> maybe not that <laughs> true to life, but I think if you are, um, if you don't mind that, uh, then it's perfectly fine to kind of bask in the the immediate romance of Europe <laughs> through her series. Yeah. I enjoyed it for the most part, but I think reading it all together like I did, I got rather annoyed mm-hmm. <laughs> with how surface level <laughs> her observations about Italy tend to be. <laughs> um, I think if I was reading like a little bit at a time, I might be like, ah, oh, lovely. <laughs> Italy. Ah, <laughs> oh, Rome. But all together, I was like, Okay. Yeah. yeah. They've got wine in Italy. Amazing. <laughs> what an observation. <laughs> but yeah, I really enjoyed Gente a lot more than I thought I would. Mm-hmm. I ended up really just enjoying hanging out with these characters who are very kind, uh, lovely grandpas, mostly. <laughs> you ended up liking the old men much more than I think you expected to. <laughs> Yes, that is certainly true. Probably not in the same way that Natsume Ono <laughs> likes those old men, but um, I was very charmed. I was very charmed. Uh, the old ladies as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of the stories focus on like some of their wives and girlfriends, and I enjoyed those as well. So, Also, a grandkid who is the cutest. <laughs> Natsume Ono draws adorable children they're just kind of on the fringes of all of the series but i yeah super cute they are (laughs) there's some adorable kids in her stuff but i think that one is probably one that uh long time anime fans especially those who do watch uh, more niche shows more uh shows that aren't necessarily in the public eye that often uh, may have heard of it's the the anime came out well a long time ago like over 10 years ago <laughs> so we and i think that that and the interest of restaurante parody is a kind of influenced the amount that of her works that we did get in english over the course of the last decade or so um because as i mentioned we've we've gotten quite a quite a good chunk of her work um both long running stuff or longer titles multiple volume titles um, as well as the short story collections. Yeah, we've gotten so much from her. And speaking of those short story collections, in a similar vein to Ristorante Paradiso, um, I did want to pick up one of her short story collections, just sort of as a representation. Um, and G, out of all of them, uh, recommended La Quinta Camera, which I believe started its life as a webcomic, hmm. but it's collected in a single volume. And I got a similar vibe from that that I did from Ristorante Paradiso, where Mm -hmm. it's just, it's about a group of guys and a girl who moves in with them in their flat in Italy. And it's just, you know, it's just vibes, man. Italian vibes. Mm -hmm. (laughs) 
It is also um, incidentally nice. her first published work, uh, kind of just ever. We do have a, a collection of her um, stuff that she she wrote before that, but wasn't published um, until much later. So it's really really early stuff from her. Yeah, and I think the most like noticeable thing about it, just like looking at it, is that the art style of her short story collections and her older work is much different from her art style now, which Mm -hmm. even her art style now is very distinctive and very immediately recognizable Mm -hmm. as her. Um, But her older stuff really doesn't look like what you would even consider as manga, um, it looks very underground um, in a lot of ways. It's got, and it <laughs> it sort of fits with the whole reveling in the aesthetic of Europe. Um, uh, there's a lot of, I don't know, everyone looks so, uh, they have a particular look, which half the time makes them look like, like Vogue models <laughs> and just again also <laughs> being dumped into this moment and enjoying their coffee or their cigarette or whatever and just watching the time pass. <laughs> the slightly tousled hair, <laughs> the like heavy lidded eyes, wide Very set mouth, so. long fingers. <laughs> 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 but yeah, uh, her early stuff in particular with like the characters having this almost western cartoon kind of look to them Mm -hmm. um with their big heads and big eyes on this like little body it's very cute it gave me like a greeting card feel Mm -hmm. um and i kind of see how that has carried itself into her more detailed and very elegant vogue model style that she has now yeah uh, especially in the facial expressions, there's something very cute about them. Um, with these, like, big, like, doe eyes and the big goofy frown, very low set on the face. Mm. <laughs> um, they, yeah. It has a very distinctive look. <laughs> and it's, it's interesting when reading because you can, uh, the characters can be, like, just oozing this this nonchalant style um, (laughs) in certain panels and then dependent (laughs) on, you know, reactions, dependent on the situation, the next panel has them very cute and you're like, oh, that's really sweet. What? How? (laughs) 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 Oh my gosh. It's so funny, like, reading House of Five Leaves Mm -hmm. um, and, like, seeing this style that, like, makes... Some of her characters look so cool and nonchalant be used to make Masa look like the most anxious wreck that you've ever <laughs> seen in your life. <laughs> At all times. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the most uncomfortable boy. The mo- Oh, th- that poor boy. He, he is consistently just high stress, but... I think that's that's <laughs> part of his journey over the course of that series. And we are, of course, talking about the protagonist yeah. of, personally, my favorite of Natsume Ono's works, House of Five Leaves. Um, it's eight volumes long. The entirety of it was released by Fizz, as was Ristorante Paradiso and Agente. Um, I don't think we mentioned that earlier. <laughs> um, majority of the stuff that we've gotten from her, uh, or the older stuff that we've gotten from her, has been viz but we have seen other publishers pick her stuff up as well um and that one eight volumes long it's set in historical japan and is about a group of various individuals who have sort of fallen into well it's about a anxious he's not quite a samurai he he was let go from duty he because he was just an anxious. he was a bodyguard yeah and he can't really find work mm. because of his personality, unfortunately. Um, and so he's... He's just... As soon as you get more than two people in a room around him, he just cannot function. Yeah. He's got very <laughs> severe social anxiety. And thus, he's been looking for work. He's been kind of drifting along, just, um, you know, trying to trying to find something stable for himself to do. And he un- unexpectedly falls into this group who he discovers... Um, kidnaps 
the young heirs of uh, wealthy families for ransom and uh, gives them, you know, and basically makes money that way. <laughs> Ransoms yep. people for money. And there is a larger, like, there's... Bunch of low legs. Yeah, there's a there's <laughs> a reason for this, and you do learn more of to why each of these characters are involved with this. Um, but they're not necessarily like obviously kidnapping and ransoming people is not a good thing. These are very morally great yeah, characters, um, but they certainly have their. They're reasons. not entirely <laughs> on the up and up. Uh, Masa is very like scandalized by all of this immediately. Like he even like he even meets Otake, who's like one of the women mm-hmm. in the group, mm-hmm. and she is very, very <laughs> much the sort of femme fatale esque geisha type of character. Um, she is in the group after being bought out of her brothel that she was in, and Masa is very scandalized by her <laughs> very being. From the beginning. Uh, he gets used to her pretty quickly because she's pretty easygoing, but mm-hmm. <laughs> it's kind of like, oh, baby. <laughs> <laughs> we also have sort of a career thief in this group. We have a tavern owner and sort of his daughter. She's not. She doesn't really get caught up in it, but she, she is involved in certain aspects. And, of course, the ever, the ever mysterious leader of this group, Yaichi, who's the one who kind of suggested oh. this. <laughs> um, hey, G. Yes? G. Yes. You forgot who? The most important member, the handsome older gentleman. <laughs> 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 he's not technically in the group, but like he's kind of in the group. He just holds the hostages. Oh, yeah. At I his mean, place. He's, so, but... he's not in a lot of the. Apologies for forgetting the handsome older gentleman. He's... But. <laughs> He's not in a lot of the meetings, let's be fair. <laughs> That's true, but he is very present. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, Yaichi is the sort of leader, enigmatic leader, uh, who Masa is initially sort of hired by, I guess, as a bodyguard, because specifically because Yaichi thinks he's going to be useless. Mm-hmm. Um, and surprise to him, uh, Masa does actually know his way around a sword. He's just anxious. <laughs> um, and he ends up falling sort of deeper and deeper from that. Mm-hmm. But I think the reason Masa's drawn to Yaichi from the beginning is he is very drawn to how suave and nonchalant and cool Yaichi is in everything that he does. Mm-hmm. It's very much the kind of person that Masa wants to be. He's he's sort of the the kind of polar opposite to Masa in a lot of ways. Just and thus he becomes sort of the the <laughs> em, emblematic of the person he kind of wants to be or is all, the person he's always respected and uh so yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, important point, mm-hmm. uh, he only comes up to Masa's, like, chest, <laughs> and, um, they're a good ship, and that <laughs> height difference is really good. <laughs> <laughs> and you are not, you are certainly not alone in that sentiment, um, that's definitely an undercurrent that a lot of fans, a lot of, um, readers, I think, feel. It's not exactly subtle, <laughs> their, their interactions. Look, I'm just saying if, um, Basso wanted to write a doujinshi <laughs> about them, I would buy it. <laughs> <laughs> it would certainly be, um, welcome. Welcome. Um, and I know you haven't actually finished this one, but you have read quite a bit of it. You read uh, three quarters of it, which is a huge chunk of those eight volumes. And um, I'm interested to see or to hear your your opinions on it, not having hit the quite the ending of it yet. Uh, it was a rocky start for me. Mm-hmm. I The first volume I didn't dislike, but I really didn't get off very well with Masa. <laughs> I was just annoyed by him. Uh-huh. So I was like, 
I mean, I think you're supposed to be. He's very tactless, and he just... I almost feel like it's because he's in this place where he has convinced himself he's not good at anything, mm-hmm. that he has become not good at anything. Like, it's not just the bodyguard jobs, but it's, like, any job that he picks up, he's just terrible at. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was just like, come on. Because <laughs> it didn't seem like he was growing any self-awareness yeah. very quickly. <laughs> um, but House of Five Leaves is a slow burn, and he finds a bit of inner strength throughout the next couple of volumes Mm -hmm. and at the point i am in the series three quarters in he he, he's a very strong character and it's become very clear the effect that he has on the other members of the gang Mm -hmm. and i feel like all of the members of the group obviously it's like this found family thing and i feel like it's Mm -hmm. very effective in that because you definitely understand the role both emotionally and practically, that each member has. And uh, they have this, you know, this little restaurant, this little hole in the wall that they all meet at that becomes kind of a home for them. And uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Again, it's vibes, man. I enjoy the vibes. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it certainly, I mean, that, this series and... The, I think the next series we're, we're going to be talking about, which is Akka, has more of a plot, like there's more going on, but it's still very much uh, the slow burn character focused, atmospheric uh, drama seinen that Natsume Ono is so good at um, and I think uh, as Ray said, yeah. it's a slow burn It's a lot of her titles are and so if you don't immediately click with it that is totally understandable because i do think it takes a little time to figure out quite what's happening what's quite what the point of a lot of stuff uh going on but for house of five leaves in particular and masa in particular um you there's a very strong character arc of growth throughout the series and the ending and the beginning parallel each other very well it and so i'd be interested if you do uh, decide to finish it in, in some relative time how you how you find it by the end but it is it's very good and again available from fizz if you're wanting to buy it <laughs> beautiful yeah. signature editions as well digitally too yes yes yep you've got options <laughs> yeah and i feel like that aspect of like taking a more serious story but taking it at a more leisurely pace uh, that's sort of a commonality between this and Akka. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll get into it more when we get into Akka, but I felt like that that those pacing choices and the darker story, that mix was handled a lot more smoothly mm-hmm. in House of Five Leaves, in my opinion, mm-hmm. than in Akka. Um, there's a lot in Akka where I felt like certain aspects of the story and the atmosphere are just, like, doing battle with each other, Mm -hmm. whereas House of Five Leaves just feels, like, very natural in the way it's being told. I didn't feel that kind of dissonance with it, Mm -hmm. and I felt like her art style really fit it with the sort of deathly pale faces and the ghosty eyes yeah um and this very sort of impressionistic hatching in the backgrounds um with a lot of black space works very well for the atmosphere that house of five leaves is creating it's sort of an elegant tint on a gritty grimy backstreet of edo era well edo (laughs) What was Tokyo, right? Yeah. Uh, hopefully people who are listening to our podcast know that. <laughs> <laughs> and if you don't, you've now learned. So, I mean, don't say you never yeah. learned anything on these there podcasts. There you go. <laughs> um, in the Edo era, it was called the Edo era because Tokyo was called Edo in the Edo era. <laughs> and that's when samurai were around. <laughs> and geisha. Yes. <laughs> anyway... <laughs> 
Uh, did you want to talk about not simple? Yeah, sure. I think I think we'll before we get into Aka thirteen, which is sort of her more recent work that we've gotten published. Technically, we are still is still being published because the sequel is coming out, or the second the sequel is just finished, um, in English. But not simple is I think the first of her titles in English that we got. Um, I for a lot of people, including myself, it was the first of her works that we read because it is one volume. It's it seems like it's everywhere. I feel like you can buy this book um, at like mm-hmm. a half price bookstore for cents on the dollar. Like it's it's just one that is no. floats around a lot. Um, very divisive. Very a much darker story. Uh, still character focused and and somewhat of her style, but it is less hopeful, a less a lot less leisurely. Um, compared to the the titles we've been talking about thus far. And I know you, Ray, Mm -hmm. definitely have uh, a much more negative opinion of this one. (laughs) Yeah, I don't like it. (laughs) Uh, It's a big, thick volume. I feel like it's one that a lot of people who are looking to get into more, like, underground manga, Mm this will be often one of the first books that they find Mm -hmm. perhaps not even knowing that it's Ono Um, because this is in her earlier like sort of alternative style yes Uh, it's basically just a character study of this kid named Ian he's not a kid he's in his 20s he's a kid but from his life (laughs) his like Um, from his childhood he's Australian as well it's like set in Australia for no reason other than like I don't know we have we we call him Ian. It's set in like Australia and also is it the UK? Yeah, parts of Europe. I not it's been a while since I've read it, so I had not not exactly the um, clearest. But yeah, I just read it and I don't remember a lot about <laughs> it, which <laughs> indicates my opinion. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's about his extremely sordid life story and him sort of telling it to this author who is fascinated with him possibly infatuated with him Mm -hmm. but wants to write a book about his life Mm -hmm. because it is fairly extraordinary in its just unending misery yes uh fair warning for those Um, who are wanting to get into the book it covers topics of childhood sexual assault and abuse uh, physical abuse, um, AIDS, and other other various sexual diseases, and just like it's a, and it's it's not a happy ending either. This is not a fun time, mm. like a fun read, um, and it's there's not a lot of hope in it aside from Ian as a character, his own personal hope and his own personal optimism, which I mean it may appeal to. Those who love stuff like Goodnight Poon Poon, in which the world is terrible and bad things happen to good people for no reason, um, and sometimes that's just life. It's definitely on that sort of note. Um, so you're not going to feel like all warm and soft and fuzzy after this book. <laughs> just fair warning. Yeah. And for me, that was that comparison to Poon Poon actually works really well mm-hmm. because I also don't like Goodnight Poon Poon. <laughs> Especially the ending mm-hmm. with the the writer. I just walk away from the book feeling like I don't understand what it's trying to accomplish. Mm-hmm. And for me, that is important when I'm reading. I've found, I guess I'm very <laughs> utilitarian in that way. I don't need every book that I read to like be like, And that's the moral of the story, (laughs) kids. Like, I don't think Ristorante Paradiso has a moral, and I thought that one was fine, Mm -hmm. because I understood the point, which was, look at this nice restaurant with these nice men, let's have a relaxing time. Mm -hmm. But, you know, a book that's just like, the world sucks, and bad things happen to good people, and that's it. (laughs) doesn't strike me as particularly useful Mm -hmm. it first of all it's not how I see the world Mm -hmm. um I think that if we don't hold on to some kind of hope if we don't try to make our situation better 
that's it, you know? Yeah. That, it, that's it. <laughs> so I'm kind of, I don't really like stories that I feel are kind of wallowing in misery. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, that was how I walked away from this book. Just yeah, personally. I 100% agree. Like, I, I do like it more than you, but it's certainly not my first uh, recommendation for Ono. It's, it's something that if you're already, um, if you're looking for that type of story, if you're already a fan of that type of story and you haven't read it and you see it for cheap, go right ahead. Like, <laughs> you're not gonna, if you know what to prepare mm -hmm. for, then it's, it can be, you know, very successful at what it does. And I think it is successful at what it does. But it's not inherently, out of the birth of her works that we've gotten, it's, it's not what I would say, even what I would hold up as as representative of her work because we see in her later stuff um how how different it is just tonally um to not simple and again mm -hmm. uh like with with um what we were talking about earlier with looking to camera this is her second um the second thing she ever wrote so um i don't know whether it was just through a, <laughs> a series of kind of experimentation trying to figure out what type of story she wanted to tell that led to this a particular book or and then later being more comfortable in stuff like Ristorante Paradiso and Arca etc um, but yeah it's certainly not emblematic of of what her normal books are like even if there is sometimes <laughs> a more dour side or a more dramatic or a su kind of subdued um, you know bad stuff may be happening but there is a larger point to it and there is like other stuff going on it's not just a bleak uh, depressing <laughs> that like book that's gonna make you feel bad at the end of it shit sucks and then you die <laughs> pretty much <laughs> and I will say um because I'm also not really I like I don't I have nothing against people who are fans of Pun Pun I'm not I just kind of refuse to read it I read half of it and it wasn't for me um and at least with this yeah. it's only one volume versus 13 <laughs> volumes of that so like yeah is, well there is that the, ba <laughs> the balance may may uh turn in owner's favor in that regard if if uh, pun pun was just too much too much bleakness for too long <laughs> you want your bleakness in bite sizes yeah. yeah so that's not simple and i guess we should talk about the other sort of longer series mm -hmm. in ono's repertoire that we have gotten in english that has also gotten in anime recently Re well, recently-ish. <laughs> a couple of years ago, probably 2017-ish. I, I don't know if that's right. But it's it's yeah. much more recent than some of the other stuff. Um, House of Five Leaves also, I don't think we mentioned, but it did get an anime adaptation, which you can also buy in the US, subtitled. Yep. It's available on DVD. All, so all three of her anime adaptations are available to buy and watch, if you're interested. And they're all really good, so I do recommend them. Um... <laughs> <laughs> uh, but Aka 13, uh, is, I, I, it's, it's probably my second favorite of the stuff that she's done. It's a, I guess, it's not a fantasy necessarily, but it's set in a fictional European country, um, the, the nation of Doha, uh, which has 13 very distinct districts, um, all of who have very, uh, distinct cultures and, people and sometimes politics but they're all overseen by a ruling monarchy our main character uh jean or jean otis is a member of um sort of the i guess he's a what what's the words like a, a governmental worker um he's an accountant he and sort of yeah a, kind of a police officer but not really like he doesn't he's not in, he just goes around and audits other governmental, uh, <laughs> play, yeah. Like, other... So basically, um, the kingdom of mm -hmm. Doha has an interesting sort of structure to it, where it has the monarchy, but it also has a separate entity, um, called Aka. Mm -hmm. The organization is called Aka, and they run like all of the, you know, yeah, social programs, local governmental and... stuff mostly. Yeah, uh, emergency vehicles also, like the fire station and stuff. That's all run by Aka. Mm -hmm. um, 
And they also and act as sort of a communication each... between the various districts. Um, so. Yeah. And almost a system, like a symbol of the country. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so Jean is like a works for the central branch of Akka, their inspections agency. So, like G said, he just goes around and audits the uh, branch governments the of a- Akka mm-hmm. to see if everything's on the up and up. Yeah. And uh, the series basically follows, there's been rumors of a coup against the monarchy, and so Jean is sent on sort of a whirlwind tour of all 13 districts. He has to audit all of them in succession to see if he can track down any validity to these rumors. And he may just so be it's involved. Like part, so... He may just be involved. <laughs> so it's part government conspiracy and part travelogue <laughs> part showing <laughs> off fancy breads like that's i swear like 30 lots of bread of so much bread um <laughs> and john just loves bread he loves bread so he much he loves bread the most offensive thing about this okay <laughs> is that the bread that they show it's sandwich bread <laughs> but i'm pretty sure it's shokupan japanese sandwich mm-hmm. bread and I mm. hate that stuff so much. <laughs> Shokupan is such an insult to sandwich bread. <laughs> and yet, they describe it in such loving terms. <laughs> but... Uh, uh, no. <laughs> Every time they described, like, chocolate sandwich bread or walnut sandwich bread, I was imagining flavored Shokupan. <laughs> and I was just angry. I saw, like, I... I... <laughs> I always imagined it as like the honey, the honey bread that you get in particular cafes in Korea. It's a dessert, and it again, I don't know if it's the same thing as what you're talking about, but it's a very thickly si- sliced white bread, kind of cakey, and they just drizzle mm-hmm. stuff on it. Yep. and you eat that as a dessert. <laughs> That's they just eat it without drizzling stuff on it. They just got stuff in it like walnuts or pistachio yeah. or fruit or whatever who knows all so many wondrous amazing breads in this series um but not only yeah. so we follow jean on his whirlwind tour he has a best friend from high school called nino who is a uh, photojournalist and he who is the, hot he is hot he is definitely <laughs> hot and then he has his younger sister um what's her name uh, I can't remember. Lotta. Uh, thank you. Um, who is... they? So they, they don't own a building, but they are the landlords to like this big apartment building. So that's basically... She's a high school student, but she kind of looks after... The, the two of them look after this building. Um, they were orphaned at a... Like 10 years ago, or more than. Um, much younger age. And so it's basically... And John is very... Um, I guess well known in the city and in the Aka kind of department because he is a he he smokes he he smokes cigarettes and that is a luxury that only the super super wealthy can afford because the monarchy out like outlawed it banned it um, from particular. Mm-hmm. parts because the king himself was he liked his cigarettes and now they're like no we need to protect the health of the king so no more smoking um and as a public servant basically it's kind of a shock to see <laughs> that he he has interest in smoking and that he does yeah. smoke very often um and i mean he is a very inconsiderate smoker <laughs> yes um and uh i mean in real life smoking is a gross and a bad habit and do i do not encourage it but man is it lovingly rendered and cool looking in arca 13 <laughs> like damn it stop <laughs> making this cool like how dare you <laughs> um yeah that's what he does all day it's just you know ruin his health with his cigarettes and clock his arteries with dessert bread yep. and then ha- <laughs> like half the time maybe audit a government building but it's <laughs> Not, yeah. not really. Very leisurely. He's 
And nobody trusts, like, the work that he does because he's so nonchalant, but then, of course, he's actually very good at his he's job. He's very good at his job, but he's also, um, like, he really doesn't want to progress. Like, he doesn't care about- He's constantly trying to quit, also. <laughs> he just, he doesn't want to, like, be- because he has the skills to be, like, at the head of the department, um, you know, kind of delegating to all these different people- and he he has no interest. He has zero interest. He's just coasting along because it it's a job and it's something to do and it's easy for him. Yeah. So. I feel like the secret reason is that he really wants to be topped by the director chair. So. <laughs> I mean. Um, who he definitely has a huge crush on and so do I. <laughs> um. Yeah, she, she's great, and she comes from a district populated entirely by hot lesbians. Yeah, so. I mean, some of these districts are pretty um, wonderful. I We have a question later about, like, which district would you want to live in or be posted in. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, the, uh, with 13, I mean, you're spoilt for choice, certainly. Um, and they are all very distinct. They have yep. distinct weather... They have distinct industry, and because of that, there's a lot of conflict between districts as well as to who provides more for the kingdom or the country and how much they should be given because of that, etc. It's politics. Politics. <laughs> yeah. So there's a... Honestly, it reminded me, it reminded me a lot of the U.S., mm -hmm. like, the way that nobody quite knows if these districts... Can even be called part of the same country mm. um there's even some like secession mutterings going on in certain districts mm -hmm. that felt the way that the culture varies so drastically depending on which district you're in also felt very similar yeah. in a lot of and ways think, to the u.s um yeah I, I think we see it in the u.s even here in australia like my state versus the east coast um, there's a lot of different tensions and a lot of different, like, what, what certain states bring to the table in their imports and exports, etc. And, uh, and I, Europe as well. I mean, even England, but uh, throughout Europe, it's, it's something that <laughs> is very, I guess, um, reflective of true life, or despite this being a mm -hmm. fictionalized country and a fictionalized setting, um, it is something that is pretty, pretty on point when we're talking about, like, just... A large <laughs> landmass being grouped together. The thing I think yep. American specifically is uh, more so how how much of the governing is left up to each individual district. Mm -hmm. Like, the branch government pretty much just does everything in the district, and the federal government just kind of shows up randomly <laughs> to be like, are your papers in order? Mm -hmm. Um, even though they ostensibly have a king. <laughs> Anywhere with states, I guess. <laughs> Anywhere with, with lots of people in a relative area <laughs> who've been there uh, kind of interacting <laughs> with each other for a long time, but not quite being the same as each other. For <laughs> So there's, there's going to be some conflict and some, some discussion, to say the least. <laughs> yeah, uh... This series, it's, uh, yeah, like I said a little bit when we were talking about House of Five Leaves, for me, the balance was off mm -hmm. a lot of the time. Like, I feel like, especially in the latter half, you know, the first couple of districts we spend quite a bit of time in, we get this loving, like, showcase of what's special about the district, but as you go on more and more time is devoted to this conspiracy and less and less to the districts mm -hmm. to the point where the last couple I'm just like it's basically the anime version of Coover PD which is a town here in Australia where it get it's in the middle of the desert so it gets so hot that the entirety of the like town is just underground everyone's houses and all the stores it's just that but in anime and uh, uh, an entire state. Like, we don't have an entire state that does that. But <laughs> I was like, oh, hey. Yeah, except with some 
very weird philosophizing about how poor people are actually happy because they have something to strive for. <laughs> yeah. That was weird. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there's like, there's a cold district with lots of there's snow and like cute little cafes. Uh-huh. Yeah, the like awesome retirement district where everyone lives to be super old and they just hang out on the beach in luau all the time <laughs> that would have been great um the giant food district there's the one that's where? giant food district the biggest <laughs> strawberries you've ever seen in your life and everybody's like seven feet tall <laughs> um and there's the one that's just hot lesbians <laughs> in well tailored uniforms yep um there's a sailor district with lots of fish. Oh, yeah, and there's, there's the Les like Mis a, district. A cowboy district. <laughs> there's the Les Mis district. The I saw Les Mis and thought Enyel Ross was really hot <laughs> district. <laughs> I mean, I don't blame her. Uh, yeah, it's not a bad <laughs> sentiment to put into manga. Um, and there's. Um, uh, there's the state of Arizona. There's also the state of Nevada, or more specifically, yeah. maybe Las Vegas, um, just as districts. Yep, that's the cowboy district. Yeah. Unfortunately, the Arizona district um... <laughs> has uh. some questionable, <laughs> some questionable um... fashion choices. Yeah. <laughs> not. Yeah. Not... It's very much like Natsume Ono. Googled some Navajo patterns and, you know, maybe Mm. one issue of National Geographic from 1979 and decided to draw the characters in the cool hip fashions of the Navajo people and probably did not do adequate research about what she was portraying we have some feathers in the hair as a fashion statement yeah um it's very also like they're not depicted as there's another district that's like persia Mm -hmm. right and those characters are the only like visibly Mm dark-skinned people in the entire series which for reasons that come down to how this conspiracy wraps up, it very ends up being more problematic than it had to be. But it's especially problematic uh, in that the people who are wearing these Navajo-esque costumes are not... They're not depicted as darker-skinned mm. or as... You know, as people of color, essentially, we have the council member who's a member of that district Mm -hmm. on the cover of a volume, and he's very, very pale. Yes, yes. Which is just kind of, it's like, uh, yeah, (laughs) gonna be a yikes for me, you know? (laughs) Yeah, it's certainly not the most, um, uh... Yeah, it, mm, 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 there's there's issues. There's certainly issues <laughs> with it, putting it lightly. I was so mad with how that district was handled, too, because I was like, oh, cool, it's like a Persian district. Mm-hmm. It reminded me of, like, the Persian couple from A Bride Story mm-hmm. with all those beautiful gardens, and I was like, that's awesome. We're going to spend a quick holiday with all these beautiful flower gardens, but that's right at the end of the series, so we spend, like, no time there at all, and he's there, and he's, like, he sees, like, two people on the street, and he's, like, their smiles look forced. And he sees some flowers, and he's, like, those flowers are creepy. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just, like, I don't understand why this district is so bad. Mm-hmm. Like, why are you judging people you just saw on the street, John? Like, maybe... Maybe they're just having some allergies, okay? Maybe. Like, I didn't understand why... Like, I feel like if you're trying to build this one district as being sinister in some way and having this sort of sinister... Yeah, the the larger mystery of, like, maybe there's some answers to the conspiracy here. 
that. There's more. You need mm-hmm. to do a little bit more. You need to spend more <laughs> and time I- there and maybe skip the Vegas district and skip the underground district and give yourself a little time. Mm-hmm. Maybe skip a few of your trips to the bakery. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> Because this is pretty vital content, and it ends up a lot more problematic than I think it needs to be. Mm -hmm. And of course, like, Um, I think with all of this, it was never, it was never Ono's intention, but obviously coming from uh, a mindset that is a little bit more informed, that isn't just using things for aesthetic purposes, like, you, you recognize that, you know, these are, these are issues and they absolutely have to be addressed when we discuss discuss the series well yeah i mean i just mentioned like a bride story Mm -hmm. like you know it's not like you can it's not like japanese people are incapable of like doing a little cursory research about persia before depicting a culture based on it Mm -hmm. so it's kind of like you know it's kind of like the italian so i think that you know where it, it yeah, just it's kind of it's part of her feels... just like being interested in the aestheticism of cultures more so than necessarily diving deep into what they represent and why they may be important to the people from those areas and why certain things shouldn't be depicted the way they are. Problem. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, a problem. It's a problem. It's a big problem. I expect, I mean I'm I'm from Arizona. Mm-hmm. Um, that's where my family lives. They live right on the edge of the Navajo reservation. So, like, seeing that really struck a nerve mm-hmm. <laughs> in a way that, you know, it might not have if it was somewhere a little further from home. But, it, yeah. Mm. 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 <laughs> but I do think it's, it's valid to say that, me. like, as a what series... It's a little bit shorter than, I mean, it's a longer, one of her longer series, but it is shorter than Five Leaves. And I think it does have such a leisurely pace early on. Um, and it, it takes so long to get to the main, like the larger plot that it kind of does suffer as into trying to cram everything into the ending. And so you do get that disconnect between the, you know, that, what we were talking about, the aesthetic of, like, hanging out in a cafe and eating good food and smoking a cigarette and, like, watching the world go by, and then also, like, oh, government conspiracy, and oh no, there's a coup, and oh Mm -hmm. no, this person's been shot, and oh no, this person's been revealed to be someone else, and, you know, (laughs) like, that's very end-loaded, and it feels like that could have been developed a lot easier throughout the six volumes if she had jumped to that a little bit earlier. Also, to me, it just wasn't a very interesting conspiracy. Mm-hmm. Like, the resolution of it kind of made my eyes roll a little bit. <laughs> uh, well, the actual resolution also was, I was like, okay, we're just going to keep the oppressive monarchy. Mm-hmm. Okay, <laughs> cool. We're not going to change anything? That's fine. Okay. <laughs> and then, like, the one district secedes. Um, and they're like, we're going to keep the 13 in our logo with the hope that they will one day rejoin. You know, we have some states working very hard to become independent mm-hmm. in the real world and their mother country constantly insisting that they're actually still part of. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, I feel like this is Japan. This artist is from Japan. And we've got a very obvious example of this right next to that country, so... Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just like, maybe think. Mm. <laughs> maybe think. <laughs> uh. Uh. <laughs> it's like I didn't dislike the experience of reading the series, but it's like when I, when I think about mm-hmm. it, I get more annoyed. Mm-hmm. It's a... It's a um... <laughs> Yeah, after the fact, because reading it, I don't think there's that much, like, I mean, things will jump out at you, and there's problems. It's not a perfect series, absolutely. Um, but <laughs> it's definitely kind of those, those after you've percolated those thoughts a little bit, that you understand why things seem off or seem things upset you <laughs> more so <laughs> than when you're actively reading it. Yeah. 
But what I was actually saying was that I didn't think the conspiracy was interesting <laughs> because they introduced, like, two characters who are potentially bad, mm -hmm. and one of them is introduced as, like, scowling and mean, and the other one is introduced as, like, smiling and nice, and in the end, they're like, actually, the scowly mean guy was a good guy, oh, and the smiley God. nice guy was a bad guy. <laughs> Yeah. And I was like, oh, wow, did we really need to spend this much time to get there? <laughs> I'm, I'm interested to, and I don't know if you'd, you'd be interested in reading it, but they do have a two-volume, like, postscript series, sequel series, literally called ARCA 13 PS. Um, and I don't know, I haven't mm -hmm. yet read it. I don't know what it's about, aside from I assume stuff that happened after the events of the ending. Um and I'd, I'd be interested to see how that plays out. I can't actually speak to it because, as I said, I haven't read it. Um, but there is technically more Akka available. And um, b both this, this the original series and the sequel series have been licensed by Yen Press. I don't think we mentioned that. Um, so you can, again, buy it digitally or physically, whichever you prefer, um, if you're wanting to try it. Um... But there is, I think, I don't know whether it's because Ono wanted to explore the world more or explore the characters more and whether or not a two-volume additional thing will help with some of the problems. Like, they won't help with some of the, a lot of the problems that we've talked about. <laughs> <laughs> but whether or not it would have a different perspective or a different interest um, that may, you know, potentially be interesting versus what was if it was set form. in the middle mm -hmm. if it was set in the middle of the series and just like going out to the districts and stuff or exploring characters more i feel like i'd be interested but like since if it's after as a postscript i feel like the way that the series ended shook things up in such a not smart mm -hmm. <laughs> way that for me i would just be annoyed. <laughs> <laughs> well, as I said, it is called PS, but I don't actually know if it's set afterwards. I because I haven't read it. I know nothing about it. I haven't even looked at the Wikipedia <laughs> article for it. Um, but it for those who have read Akka and and enjoy it, then that is also available. But it, the second volume, which is the final volume of that series, it had I think just came out this month or last month. So um, it is it is available if you're wanting to read it, along with some of the other, like, we, a lot of, we haven't really mentioned them by name, but, uh, Ona also has other short story collections, um, uh, Tesoro, which is her early, early, early stuff, um, as well as Danza, which is, like, a bunch of characters in a single town, um, and that's kind of everything that we've gotten from Ono, in English, at least, um, but she does have a couple other mm -hmm. um, series, longer series in Japan. Um, she has a seven volume historical drama um, again, Slice of Life series called Futagashira and then she has a ongoing series called Lady and Old Man um, which I don't know if that's an indicative title. I feel like it's a, a <laughs> A cop drama. I know she has another series called Coppers, which is obviously like a cop drama. Um, well, I mean, it's a slice of life, but it's to do with cops. Um, or policemen, uh, whichever you prefer. Uh, uh, so... Well, <laughs> no thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I think it's mainly because she's interested in the uniforms more than anything else. <laughs> this is not... I mean... Yeah, I think that's why she drew Akka, is because she likes different kinds of bread and different kinds of uniforms. Pretty much. Um, and Lady <laughs> and Old Man, I don't know whether it's... I I've, think I've heard that it's about, like, a detective and, a, like, an unexpected partner or whatever. But, that so that's her current stuff. I'd be really interested in reading Furugashira, um, if we ever got it. But it's a little bit older now, and it's... Um, it's kind of missed its opportunity, but who knows? Who knows? Um, I've there's been more surprise licenses than I've I've ever expected over the last couple of years. So, so, considering that Ono is an established 
mangaka in the West is an, like a pretty well-regarded creator, and we have so much of her stuff in English. Hey, we might, we might get it. Who knows? Maybe. Maybe. Um, also, as and we kind of briefly touched on it um, a little bit earlier, but Ono does also publish BL under the moniker Basso, um, and she has a whole ton of stuff. Uh, that she's put out that way as well. Um, a lot, a lot of BL regarding older men. I mean, what she knows what she likes, <laughs> and <laughs> none of which ever has ever come to English. And I think there's probably a reason why, because most BL fans, um, especially uh, during the like the boom of, in the early two thousands, didn't care about romance between old men. They wanted hot teenage boys. And hot office workers falling in love. Not not so much not so much the silver foxes and those heading into retirement. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, do we wanna get into just just a couple of questions that we got this time? Absolutely. Uh, so the first one that we got is having to do with Akka. Uh, this is from uh, at Pixelated Lenses, Mercedes, a uh, friend of the show. If you lived in the kingdom of Doha from Akka, which district would you live in? I mean, honestly, that giant food district is pretty, pretty tempting. <laughs> um, the, but the tropical one's also really good. <laughs> like, I would be down to live in, like, a tropical yeah. paradise where everyone lived to be over 100. That'd be fun. Everyone's having luau's and just hanging out at the beach. Yeah. It'd be great. <laughs> Yeah, I thought about this one long and hard. <laughs> the giant food district does not appeal to me as I'm already thick enough without the help of strawberries the size of my head. But uh, the obviously the, uh, the one with dashing ladies in uniform is very appealing to me. Yeah. Uh, however, I agree with G that I would like to live in awesome luau retirement land <laughs> that just seems like a very strong uh decision for my future <laughs> so i'm just gonna like yeah you could just wear like healthy... swim outfits and like really breezy mm -hmm. breezy fashion all the time you just no one would ever care yep everyone's so relaxed and chill you just you're just like you're old you're, you're retired, you're hanging out on the beach with your other old retired friends, you have a luau every night, you know, <laughs> just, it sounds great, um, it sounds great. And then the next question is from Zach from Uchu Shelf, uh, have you two looked into Ono's new series Badon yet? And if so, how fast would you buy it if or when it gets released in English? I haven't. I I feel like I'm all Ono'd out for a <laughs> while, so... It's a, it, yeah, it's a relatively new series. I think it started in 2019. Um, it, so only a couple of volumes out so far. And again, very, very... Probably, I'm making an informed assumption here that it's going to be a slow burn slice of life. <laughs> um, and <laughs> uh, so here, uh, I'm reading from Buck Updates wonderful resource if you have not ever visited this website and they describe the series as four men befriend each other in prison after they got released they moved to the capital badon to open a high class tobacco shop together the four are determined to start a new path in life um hey oh it's it's related to aka so <laughs> that's maybe why we have oh. tobacco and cigarettes yet again um, I mean, I'd certainly be interested in, I, f I find, like, ex-convict stories and redemption stories and kind of, um, it's re, re yourself after, um, you know, a prison term fairly interesting and, and not something that we see a lot of in manga and in media generally. Uh, I mean, certain, certain, uh, forms of media. And, I mean, hey, I'd, I'd... I'd read it. Like, I wouldn't necessarily say that it's, it would be my favorite of her stuff. Um, but 
I mean, I like her other stuff, <laughs> like, well enough. I'd probably <laughs> give the first volume a, a pre-order and then write my, write my interest from there. Uh, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> Uh, we lastly, uh, just a couple questions this time. We have two questions from at Tayeye MV. The first one is: Are there any series where you felt her personal quirks or indulgences got in the way of the story? Uh, yeah, in Aka. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we we kind of discussed at length uh, as to why like her personal style suits that story but also like in negatively impacts what could have been done better um just because she is so stuck with her aesthetic with her expectation and um you know it's yeah i feel like she didn't need the conspiracy thing <laughs> like if she'd have just made a fantasy travelogue series about a guy who gets from the inspections agency who gets tasked with going to all 13 districts in succession, and then he writes a journal about his experiences. That would be a perfectly fine story. Mm -hmm. Alternatively, make a slightly dystopian fantasy world and write a government conspiracy story about it. I don't necessarily think that they mix very well. Mm. And then the, uh, I guess on, on the, uh, the opposite end of things, I think that her proclivities work well in both, like, Gente and um, House of Five Leaves. Mm -hmm. House of Five Leaves has, like, it doesn't have her Europe fetish. It doesn't have her, like, well, I guess it has old men in it, but, like, not that prominently. But it does have, you know, her sort of leisurely... Case. It has story elements that she likes. She seems to like ex-convicts, as we were just talking about. You know? Um, so there's definitely things there that she likes. I think she likes this type of nonchalant character with a mysterious past. Who smokes. That Yaichi very much is. Who smokes. Who smokes. <laughs> and um, she, I she likes the, you know, the cute, fashionable girl like um, Okinu in that series is. So there's a lot there that's just her writing things that she likes, and I think that it's very well balanced with the story there. Mm -hmm. And I I remember when we were writing this list and when we were for you, for stuff to read, and for your experiencing firsthand your reading experience in, in tw Twitter DMs, um, <laughs> how... Your, how you felt about the, the European setting and and me trying to encourage, like, okay, well, House of Five Leaves is not in Europe, so you may get a different, kind of a different <laughs> vibe. And generally, it is the stronger series out of everything that I've read of hers, and I think most people would probably agree. Um, but, I mean, we said it at the very beginning, mm -hmm. like, Ono is absolutely making and creating the content that she wants, and she's out here living her best life. She doesn't care if other people enjoy yeah. it necessarily. She just writes what she cares about and what she wants to read. And sometimes that's the detriment of the story. Sometimes that's, you know, very, very effective in the story. Um, so, yeah, it can be kind of a mixed bag, just dependent from title to title. But uh, I think regardless, you know, she's very good at what she does. She's very... Uh, talented <laughs> creator and artist and, and you know i mean all i've been saying about the best way to improve akka is to make it even more self-indulgent <laughs> and knock off all the stuff that isn't so mm -hmm. <laughs> and maybe crack open a book mm -hmm. <laughs> do some research about the cultures you're aping and then the second question is what do you think her strengths are what makes her work stand out um, well, the stuff that we were just talking about, but also I think it's a very, the natural pace of mm -hmm. her stuff stood out to me. Um, when Carrick, I, I kind of liked in Akka how, even though I didn't necessarily appreciate how it came together as an effective story, I did appreciate how real it felt to just have characters who are dealing with something very serious which is these rumors of a coup in the government against the mm. king 
Um, but like most of their daily conversations are just like, what are we going to get for lunch? <laughs> or, hey, you know, you, I, I you saw your sister paperwork? walking around yesterday. Did you finish that paperwork? Do I have to submit yeah, it? Yeah, did you finish that paperwork? <laughs> it's, that, that felt very real because I feel like a good 98% of my conversations are not consequential at all. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, whereas, you know, fiction kind of has to, it has to move things along a little more. Mm -hmm. So you do want a little more dramatic substance to most of your conversations. But I think there's something interesting to the idea of maybe wanting to capture a more realistic flow mm -hmm. to conversation. Um, there were definitely moments where I was like, oh, that was just like this conversation I had the other day with my friends. And uh, I appreciated that even if the cons outweighed the pros in the end. Yeah, I think most people who've worked a government job or who've been in an office situation or had like co-workers, basically, anyone who has been in that situation, like you recognize that <laughs> in your own life. You're like, yeah, yeah, I mean, that's... Yeah, that. especially, like, his, um, Jean's, uh, you know, co-workers in his central branch office, like, mm -hmm. whenever he says, like, which district he's going to next, they're like, oh, what are you gonna bring us as a souvenir? <laughs> <laughs> Bring back yummy food, please. They and they have they always have like mm -hmm. cakes in to share because they've got like oh this bakery opened up we go and try this new food oh, and there's always there's always the circuit yeah. of like okay who's bringing delicious food to the office okay we're all gonna share it no ifs ands or buts <laughs> like I hope you brought enough for everybody yeah, yeah. anything else in terms of strengths of her work or what makes it stand out? I mean, out? Uh, we also mentioned this earlier, but her art style is just, I think, perfect for what it needs to be for her stories. It makes them very distinctive. It certainly gives um, a feel to her works, and and I think even mm -hmm. outside of the writing, just seeing her character design and seeing her, how she she draws things is... is um, it certainly sticks out, certainly makes it stand out, um, even when we're talking about other series in similar genres. I agree, but I also want to say that I did, you know, in my whirlwind tour of Natsume <laughs> Ono's manga over the last couple of weeks, um, I did find her artwork somewhat inconsistent, mm -hmm. not in terms of the character work, but the backgrounds. Mm -hmm. um, how interested she seems in drawing backgrounds or how much time she had to draw backgrounds seems to vary wildly from series to series. Yeah. And um, House of Five Leaves, I found, looked very nice most of the time. But Akka was very inconsistent. Yeah, there's a lot of sparsity um, is, in Akka. Yeah, which is a problem because such a huge part of it is a travelogue. Like, I was thinking about other travelogue or series with travelogue elements that I enjoy. Mm -hmm. Like, um, I was specifically thinking of Go With the Clouds North by Northwest, yeah. which is similar in how it combines this fast-paced thriller story with a slower paced travelogue mm -hmm. uh, in that case about Iceland and you know ultimately the thing that makes the connection work the most in that series is that the art is always on point yeah you know <laughs> like when they tell you look at this cool thing Iceland has I'm like wow Look at that cool thing Iceland has. <laughs> but if I'm reading Akka and they're like, look at this cool thing this one district has, I'm like, where? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you yeah. know? And I'm like, you know, the characters are always very well-dressed and the uniforms are always very impeccable. But if you're going to write a travel series... <laughs> 
you may not like it, but you're going to need to put that much work into your backgrounds at least. Mm -hmm. Um, and I just found that wasn't necessarily there with Akka as much as it needed to be for me. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think with that, I think that's all the questions answered. Yes. Yeah. So I think <laughs> we've reached the end of the podcast. We were quite um quite an interesting discussion, <laughs> I think. And and not so much like it's it's easy to talk about creators that you absolutely adore everything that they do and it's easy to talk about their strengths and whatever else. But I I did want to talk about um Ono because although I I do enjoy a lot of her work she isn't a perfect creator but that doesn't make her any less of less worth highlighting and her great stuff is very very like great um like i i do think that she deserves mm -hmm. um the attention that she's gotten both in japan and overseas and i think it's nice having some differing opinions as well over the course of the, the podcast <laughs> and you know regardless of of our opinions it's always interesting i think to see who in our audience has read some of these things, maybe have been introduced to Ono or any of these creators through this and may, may now be interested. And, you know, it's it's good to have a wide variety. We we are we do have expectations in the future to talk about series we dislike. Like, I know this last two years we've mainly focused on stuff we like. Um, <laughs> but there is there are plans, don't worry. Um... <laughs> <laughs> But yep. as for next month, um, um, it we are it's December. It's the end of the year, and I think like we did yeah. last year, we will be focusing on some of our favorite releases from this past year. Stuff that surprised us, stuff that absolutely exceeded yeah. our, our expectations, and maybe stuff that didn't quite hit the mark despite wanting to like it very, very much. Um, and I think we'll just do kind of our recommendations as to newish series that came out in 2020. It's been a hell of a year. I think I, that's yeah. putting it mildly. It's been, but there's been some great manga. Such an exciting out. year. This year, this year we got Rose of Versailles, y'all. Exactly. Like there's <laughs> there's some amazing stuff like, that's happening and in ping manga. pong. <laughs> it's crazy. What a year. It, mm, so uh, that'll be an exciting wrap-up, I think. Super excited um, to get to it. Of one of the only good things about 2020, <laughs> which is the manga that we got. <laughs> for as much as the world has been burning around us for the past in year, um, there for manga fans, there it has been a triumph. We have had so many wonderful series see the light of day in English. Um, and hopefully we can spotlight some of those and bring some attention. And hopefully maybe, um, whether it be for gift recommendations or for yourself, maybe, I mean, there's so much stuff as well. Like, you can't keep up with everything, so may, maybe you will discover something new. Um, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, and I'm sure I'll, I will still like ask for questions and all of that as well so look forward to that once i tweet about it as always you can follow me on twitter at collecting g the links will be in the description down below and of course oh, please please if you haven't yet subscribed to ray's youtube channel whimsical pictures uh, do that because she's wonderful and go follow her on twitter at whimsical pics it she it's great do, Go, go, go follow her social medias because I love her. You should love her. It's, it's great. Aww. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't really post YouTube videos, but I do tweet a lot. <laughs> one day we'll drag you back to YouTube. I mean, one day. I, yeah, it's just. It's been a year. Life it's, is a lot, man. It's been a year. It's, uh, that's all the explanation you need. It's been a year. It. Who, what even is making YouTube videos? Let's be real. <laughs> Honestly, to be honest. <laughs> but uh, um, hopefully... Uh, but yeah, anyway. Yeah, I hope everyone <laughs> who celebrates Thanksgiving has a wonderful celebration. Uh, namely those folks in the U.S., but please do it responsibly. Socially distance yourself. Do not... Just be smart. Please just be smart. 
celebrate everyone else who isn't celebrating um yes. <laughs> then i hope you have a wonderful rest of the month um and again please be smart we are we're almost we're almost through it guys we're almost through it and i don't know how how much of an improvement 2021 will be but it's <laughs> let's let's live well, in hope let's live in hope we don't know what the reality will be but we will live in hope and hopefully on that note you guys stay safe you guys stay smart and i will catch you in the next uh podcast and the next video on this channel as well same (laughs) bye guys happy thanksgiving